Are you looking to set up Zoho Desk for your organization? If so, this is the video for you. We're gonna be going over seven steps that we follow essentially every time here as Anata Consulting to set up Zoho Desk for our clients. My name is Tyler Colt, and before we jump in, I do wanna ask if you find this video useful, please be sure to like and subscribe down below. Leave a comment if you've got any feedback, questions, or additional video requests. And as always, make sure to head on over to Zanata.com and click on book a meeting if you're looking to chat about how we can help with your Zoho installation. So for this video, we're really gonna be breaking this down into seven main components that we run through basically every time that we set up Zoho Desk. These are essentially gonna be departments, roles, and general hierarchy, routing your emails and communications into Desk, activating or disabling any of the default notifications, doing some field customization around accounts, contacts, and tickets, configuring a handful of custom workflows, setting up your help center, and last but not least, integrating with Zoho CRM. So without any further ado, let us jump right on in. So first topic, like I mentioned, is gonna be setting up essentially your departments, your profiles, and your roles. The goal here is essentially to match the structure of your organization. Um, so inside of settings here, what we'll see is that these break down into a few different areas. So over on the left under departments, that's always where I start. Important thing to note with Zoho Desk is that departments run completely separately from each other. So you can have different users, uh, different workflows, different ticket fields, different everything between these. To create a new department, we can just come into this section, click on new department, give it a name a display name if we want a logo, anything like that. We can also associate agents with them from here and choose if they should be visible within the help center. So common breakdowns here are, you know, you might have customer support and sales. You might have a billing department. You might have an RMA department if you're dealing with physical products. But most important thing, again, to keep in mind is that these departments give you a way to set up unique processes that only run within that particular department. So really useful if you have those different types of teams that need to interact with Zoho Desk. In addition to that, you'll also wanna make sure that you've set up your role and profile settings. Um, so these are gonna break into two main components. So roles are really gonna be all about data visibility, right? And if you were to draw your org chart, these roles should essentially match that. So here we'll see we've got a CEO role, a manager role. Maybe I wanna create one more role for a agent. Here I can choose if, who they should report to and whether or not they should share data with their peers, essentially meaning should one agent see another agent's data. Um, one of the important things to keep in mind is that these work very similarly to the role settings in CRM where they are hierarchical. So a manager is gonna be able to see any data owned by an agent, but an agent is not inherently gonna be able to see any data owned by a manager. So really, again, if you were to draw out your org chart, these roles should look pretty similar to that. Um, and that'll allow you to get that initial baseline of how data should be shared and who should be able to see what within Zoho Desk. Next are profiles. These are essentially what someone can do with the data that they are able to see, right? So if we come into our agent profile, for example, we can essentially control the view, create, update, and delete permissions for any type of record inside of Desk uh, we can access their ability to, uh, you know, control their ability to access uh, the community page, social chat. We can give them permissions into how they can interact with tickets, right? Do we want people to be able to mass reply or should they have to go one by one? Um, then we can also, you know, remove or add any administrative permissions, um, you know, creating snippets, pinning conversations. What I always recommend here is give them the least possible permissions and then add them slowly over time if people find a need for them. General rule of thumb, you know, take that path of least permissions. People don't want to see or interact with things that they're not supposed to, so make sure that those are excluded from their profile settings. Next up, now that we've set up kind of the fundamentals and foundation is gonna be email routing. Um, this is a pretty quick one. So underneath the channels section, we've got email. Here we'll have this support email address. Now this is just a default email address that's been added by Zoho. Each one of your departments is essentially going to get their own. So step one, you're gonna go into your email client, whether that's Zoho Mail, Gmail, Outlook, O365, 
and essentially set up a forwarding rule from your support email address to this address right here. So in my case, I have support at zanata.com. That just forwards into a standardized address where any email sent is going to create a ticket. Then what you'll need to do is come into your from address settings and set up the address that you want to send as, as a from address. So in our case, I'll come in and I'll set up support at zanata.com as a from address so that when I go to reply to a particular ticket, I can use this address. It will do kind of a nice thing where if a ticket is sent in through support at Zanata, it's going to default to using that as a from address as long as it's been set up. Right, so you're able to essentially have that friendly address. You don't need to show them this zohodesk.com domain. This really is just going to exist in the background. While you're in here, make sure to set up your DKIM authentication. That just really helps to make sure that emails are going to be delivered properly. This is basically a little record that you're going to add to your DNS settings just to make sure, again, that when we send out from, let's say, the zanata.com domain, the recipient of that email can validate that this desk instance is allowed to use that domain, right? It's basically just saying, hey, stamp of approval from the zanata.com domain to actually send using this email address. Next up, now that we've configured our email address here, we're going to jump back into settings and we're going to go into the notification section. Um, so notification section here is important because a lot of these are going to be on by default. So it's under this customization tab and under notifications. And what we'll see is in my demo account, I've turned a lot of these off. Um, these are essentially on by default. They're organized into who's going to receive this notification, right? So contact notifications are things that are essentially going to send to the contact who submitted the ticket. Agent notifications, unsurprisingly, are going to go to our agents. Then we also have department and team notifications. And so for each of these, again, a lot of these will be on by default. You can essentially decide what types of touch points you want to automate some type of notification for. So if inside of your desk account, you want to make sure that when somebody submits a ticket, they get like an auto confirmation with their ticket number, you'd want to turn on this notification to receive a new ticket. If you want to edit or even just view the email template, these little pencil icons will pop up and I can come in here and make any changes that I would like. If you're gonna use these default notifications, I do recommend making some adjustments to the templates. Um, if you'll see here, if I open this one up, it's fine, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's pretty plain, right? You might wanna add your logo, color code it, kinda just like make sure it's on brand. You know, like I don't really like this little pre-header thing they do in the subject line. Some of this is just opinion, that's all up to you. But I always recommend when you're getting started with Desk to come into this section right away uh, because again, lots of these are going to be on that you might just not want to have on, right? Like every time they reply to a ticket, do they need another confirmation? Probably not. A lot of the times for me, this will look like this, right? When we get the ticket and when we close the ticket, we'll notify them. I like to maybe uh, notify agents when a ticket's been assigned, maybe when it's been replied. So again, you'll just want to think through what is going to make sense for you. Come through this list and activate or deactivate them accordingly. These do also support SMS notifications if you've connected in an SMS provider. Um, so if you do want to do any text message confirmations and notifications, those can be set up here really easily without having to do anything too fancy. Next up on our list is going to be customizing fields. I'm going to show this from the perspective of a ticket, but keep in mind that you can do this for your customer accounts and contacts as well. So I'm going to jump into the customization tab. I'm going to go to layouts and fields. I'm going to make sure that I'm in the right department. Like I mentioned earlier, a lot of these customizations are going to be unique to a given department. And here I can open up the module layout for accounts, contacts, tickets, calls, events, tasks, products, etc. So here I'm opening up tickets. That's really where most of your custom fields are going to go. Over on the right are all of your different field types. And then I can easily just drag those in and add them to my ticket view. So let's say that we do some type of hourly work, right? And I want to say, hey, I'm going to add in a decimal field for a work hours estimate. I can then choose if this field should be required, if we need a tooltip, if it's PHI, if it needs to be encrypted, uh, if it needs to be editable for end users. 
This is actually an important one. If you're using any forms from Zoho Desk, you want to make sure that you choose these accordingly. Um, so like in the case of this field, a work hours estimate, I don't really want the client to type that in, right? They're going to say 20 minutes, man, why not? Um, so I might say, hey, this is read only. They can see it if they were to log into their portal, but I don't want them to be able to edit or set that field because we're the ones who are going to provide the estimate and then they're going to accept the estimate. Once you have all of these added and rearranged and kind of set up how you would like them, you can go ahead and click save and or save and close and that will kind of lock in all of those fields that you've added. So now if I were to go over to, let's say just any old example ticket here, I can access that work hours estimate and say, hey, this is gonna take about five units, <laughs> let's say five hours um, of work to create this and work with this ticket. Um, and any of those different custom fields should essentially show up within these collapsible sections so that it's easy to update and work with that data while you're accessing a given ticket. Next up on the list is gonna be setting up a handful of workflows. Workflows are kind of your Swiss army knife of automation inside of Zoho Desk. Um, so if you remember that little notifications tab, really the way that you would think about these is these are all like template workflows. If a ticket is created, notify the contact. If a ticket is assigned, notify the agent. So you can use these notifications for a lot of those like quick little emails or texts that you want to have go out. For a lot of your other needs around uh, automation, you can come in and create a workflow. So I'm going to create a workflow that we do all the time. So say on agent reply, update our ticket status, right? So workflows can be used for data management. They can be used for ticket assignment. They can be used for ticket response and they can trigger on a variety of different criteria, right? So anything from the creation or edit of a ticket to the customer replying or we are replying, comments, updating particular fields, getting certain uh, happiness ratings. In my case here, again, we're going to make one where when the agent replies, so when we send something to the client, we want to update a particular field. You can also add additional criteria for these. So if this should only happen for tickets that are open, let's say, um, and maybe not a ticket that's already been closed, I can add a criteria here. And then down below, I can create and add a ton of different actions, whether that's an email alert, a task being created, a field being updated, a custom function being triggered, that could be a video of its own, even the transfer to a different department. In our case, we're gonna create a field update for this. We're gonna make a new one. And we're going to update the status. Or we're going to update it to the value on hold, let's say. Basically meaning we cannot proceed on this ticket right now because we're awaiting the client to reply to us and give us a certain piece of information. And so just like that, the workflow's on, right? Nothing too crazy. A lot of these baseline workflows are not going to take a huge amount of time or configuration to set up. They're really relatively straightforward. Now, of course, things can get a little more complicated if you're doing integration work between different applications or um, you know, creating multi-branching different workflow pads. But for version one, with the goal of keeping it simple, right? You'll probably have a handful of these little if then statements that are updating statuses, stamping date fields, you know, configuring those little uh, touch points accordingly based on your business rules. Next is going to be setting up the help center and knowledge base. So up here at the top of the page, the knowledge base is a place where we can park and store a ton of different information. Right? So these are little articles that can be organized into chapters and sections and then displayed out to our clients. Now, the knowledge base has two main purposes. One is going to be the self-serve, right, where a client can log into a help center, see those tickets and interact with them. The other is actually going to be when we are working on a ticket ourselves, right? So if I have a ticket that comes in, it's going to suggest specific knowledge base articles based on the things that have been uh, noted in that ticket. Now, in my case here, I don't have a lot of useful info here, so it's just kind of grabbing some articles. I can also search those articles. Once I find one that I like, if I want to reply to this ticket, I can essentially paste that article directly into the ticket and send it out to them, right? So I don't have to retype this information over and over again. I'm able to just pull it dynamically from the knowledge base and use it in my ticket responses. That's not all though, right? Because in a more perfect world, 
uh, you might actually have a customer log in and just get that article themselves, right? Some people are going to email you, but providing a self-service option can reduce a little bit of the manual labor that you have to do in answering these questions. So under channels, I can come in and configure a whole bunch of different things about my help center, right? Do I want people to automatically sign up? Should I allow anybody to sign up? Do I want a custom domain? I can come into customization here and change the look and feel of my help center. You know, it's not the most customizable thing in the world, just being candid, um, but you've got a couple different templates that you can kind of pick from. Um, so a ton of different functionality here within that help center. But again, the overall goal is, hey, let's create some useful content, some useful articles. Let's drop them in the help center. Maybe 20, 30, 40% of people will go there and find it. But at least for the rest of those people, uh, we'll still have that bank of articles available for us that we can use in answering our tickets, right? So again, just a bit of a double value there, um, reducing the total number of tickets that you'll receive, as well as making it easier to answer the tickets that do end up landing within Zoho Desk. Last but not least, I also want to highlight the most commonly set up integration that we have here for Zoho Desk, and that's going to be Zoho CRM. So the Zoho CRM integration, I wanted to highlight this because there is kind of, at least in my opinion, a right and a wrong way to set up this integration. So in my opinion, our demo account here is a good example of the wrong way. Um, Two-way sync, I generally do not like to do this inside of the desk and CRM integration. I really prefer having a CRM to desk sync. The reason why is because spammers are going to find your email address, right? We get this all the time as an auto. You get random junk coming in here. The problem is every single ticket is going to be connected to a contact. If there isn't one already under that email address, one will be created. So spammer at gmail.com is going to be a contact in here. And so the reality is if I'm pushing those contacts into CRM, I'm doubling up the mess. So my advice always is you're going to have some mess inside of desk. It's okay. It's really just mostly going to be spammers that are just going to come in. A contact's going to be created. They're going to be identified as spam, and then they're ignored in the future. But you can protect your CRM data by making this a one-way sync. From there, you're really just mapping the fields that are important to you to make sure that all of that data comes across from the CRM into desk for both your accounts and contacts. Then, of course, this will essentially enable you inside of a given ticket. If we're going to go ahead and open up our example here, we can click into the CRM tab, see that this person is under this account. We have these notes in CRM. We have these activities. Uh, we've got maybe any of their potentials or deals that are going to be relevant for us. And we can access all of that information from directly inside the ticket view without having to go to CRM. Now, if I do want to go to CRM, once the integration is turned on, I can just click this button and it's going to navigate me directly to that record inside of CRM without me having to find it on my own, right? So always recommend setting that up. Um, there are, of course, other Zoho integrations that are all going to be supported here. Kind of honorable mentions to Zoho Projects, Analytics, Assist and Lens if you're doing remote support. These are great tools. And then, of course, Zoho Click if you do have any of those notifications that you'd rather send out through a click channel rather than via email. So with that, those are really the big seven. Those are the main things that we're going to set up for probably 90 to 95% of desk version ones. Now, of course, there's always going to be more that you're going to want to do. You're going to want to set up SLAs. You might want to set up uh, support plans. Um, you know, you're going to come in and set up a ton of different templates. Time tracking is kind of oftentimes a version two as well. So make sure down below, leave us a comment if there's any other features in Desk that I didn't cover today that you think should be part of version one for the majority of people. Really interested to hear y'all's input on that. With that, I think we've wrapped up here for our video today. As always, I appreciate when you like and subscribe down below. Just lets us know that we're making videos that y'all are finding useful. Make sure as well, if you have any feedback, questions, uh, video requests, leave those down in the comments section. And as always, my name is Tyler Colt, and I will see you next time.